Hey everybody, my name is Kent Dobson. Welcome to another teaching here for C3, West Michigan's Inclusive Spiritual Community. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining us every week, really. We're really, really grateful um, for so many of you who are a part of this place, um, are a part of this place when we uh, gather physically in Grand Haven and also part of our online digital community. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for contributing to C3. Thanks for contributing your voice and your ideas and your money and your time. Uh, we hope that every week we stir the pot a bit and, and offer a hint, a guess, or a clue for your own journey. Uh, whether um, you consider yourself religious or non-religious or spiritual or not so spiritual, spiritual or spiritual-ish, <laughs> Uh, we hope by the variety of kinds of teachings we have, there's something for everybody. So, um, yeah, I just want to say thanks for spending some time with us. And I'm in the middle of a year-long series, which I'm calling Meaning Matters. And each month we're focusing on a different word. And if you joined us last week, you know that the word for this month is courage, which I was connecting to the French word for heart. And anyway, listen to last week's talk. And so today is really Courage Part 2 from uh, my point of view. I want to talk about a famous uh, Zen saying, and I want to read a poem. And then I want to make a few comments about the poem and about the age we live in. And maybe I'll start with the, the, the little Zen saying. And maybe some of you have heard it. And it goes like this. When I was young, the river was the river, and the lake was the lake, and the mountain was the mountain. And then I grew up, and the river was no longer the river, and the lake was no longer the lake, and the mountain was no longer the mountain. I think I said that right. Um, and then I became enlightened, and the river was the river, and the lake was the lake, and the mountain was the mountain. I love this. Um, I love this teaching because it gives us in a very succinct and simplistic form what the nature of transformation is, what the nature of, of um, the evolution of human consciousness looks like on the individual level. We could say on the broader level too, I suppose, but let's just hang out in the individual level for, for a moment. What's the journey like? It's it's, it's like beginning in simplicity. It's like um, childhood and a kind of elemental innocence that comes with childhood. And I'm not talking about perfection. I'm just talking about a kind of innocence and a kind of garden-like state, if you want to put it that way. And everybody, and we could say it's a kind of terrible gift, gets kicked out of the garden, gets pushed out of that innocence through the smallest of encounters and words and phrases and experiences and traumas and hardships and even joys and loves and passions push us into the world of complexity. That's that middle world. So from the, the place of innocence into this place of complexity. And, and the great masters, the great Zen masters say, that, um, and what does enlightenment look like? It, strangely, it looks like a kind of return where the river is the river and the lake is the lake and the mountain is the mountain. It, it's a return to simplicity and to the present. And, um, but it's not the same as going backwards. I think some contemporary spirituality and some contemporary spiritual teachers, and even sometimes when we fall in love um, with, with an idea, with an ideology, with an institution, or with a human being, there's this sense that, oh, maybe I can go back to how it once was, back to the womb where all my needs are met. But there's no going back. Not, 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 uh, that's just part of the human condition, we could say. The invitation is, is forward in, to greater consciousness. And it just happens to look like a kind of return to innocence. Um, 
Richard Rohr calls it a second naivety. That's a very fascinating phrase, a second naivety. There's a first naivety of early, early childhood, that elemental innocence, and there's a second naivety. It's on the other side of the complexities. And I'd like to suggest I'm not there, and probably many of you are not there, and I doubt if, if that many people in mainstream culture are there in this kind of um, uh, deeper acceptance of the way things are. It's accepting the complexities again and returning to the river, to the lake, and to the mountains. So I wanted to start off with that image because I want to talk about the complexities today and, and the relationship around the word courage. Because it strikes me that the time we're living in, and I, I don't want to exaggerate because I'm actually a student of history. That's I have a master's degree in history. I, I love, love, love studying history. So I, I, I'm unwilling to say right now is the most difficult challenge we've ever faced um, as a human species. But sometimes I want to say that. And I would say that we're aware of the global complexities like no other time in human history. But at the same time, part of what makes it complex is that we act, have access to technologies and medicines and antibiotics and, and water filtration systems and, and um, you know, the stuff of modern life, which, you know, has a shadow and a light side always. But it's kind of an amazing time to be alive, as you've heard me say in the past. It's um, the average life expectancy is higher than ever. Many of us can expect to live into our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, where maybe there'd be one person in a massive culture that might live to this age. But most of us, had we grown up in an earlier time or an era, would have expected to, to that old age would be something like 40, which is, it's, so it's unbelievable. And, 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 um, and our world is that interesting and that complex, yet, yet we are also facing um, amazing challenges, global challenges, which I talked about a few weeks ago bioengineering and crop engineering and, and um, genetic engineering. The vaccine itself is unbelievable what they're doing. Um, never before seen terrain in the world of technology and science, rapidly developing ways to help human beings. Um, and yet it brings all kinds of moral and ethical questions and pressures, which I say we're made for. We're made for these times. And in a way we're made, uh, or I should say we have the capacity to turn toward the complexities. Um, but that can also feel like a weight. And you know, and I know, there's a lot of fear right now floating around. And, um, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about fear. And I want to talk about anxiety, and I want to talk about angst. I want to talk about what to do. Um, what can we do in, in an age where fear and mistrust, are, that's not the only thing, but it's a pretty strong ingredient of the cultural milieu, of the cultural um, temperature, we could say, or matrix, or rubric. It's a strong percentage. I don't know what, <laughs> but... Um, it's working its way into how we feel. And let me make some definitions and then I'll read the poem. So when I say fear, I mean something direct um, and concrete, a kind of instinctual, emotional, and physiological response to something concrete, like, um, being afraid of a spider. I mean really afraid of a spider. 
Now, that might be a complex example because it's possible that from an evolutionary point of view, everyone has a kind of instinctual response to spiders. So maybe let's pick another one. Um, fear of uh, cats. <laughs> let's just say you have, have an intense fear of cats. Because when you were a child, you had a terribly mean cat that uh, bit you and you can't get over it. So that, that's what I mean about fear is directed to something concrete. If someone jumps out in front of you and scares you, as my kids like to do, um, when you're just minding your own business, walking through the house, you know, and I have that rush of fear. I know what it's about. I don't think, what does it all mean? I think, no, my kid jumped out from behind the, the closet door and scared the crap out of me. So I know exactly what it's about. So it's important to say fear is very basic and connected to something concrete. And you might say, are there reasons to be afraid right now? Well, yeah, there are some concrete things happening. Um, but fear is um, low-level fear that's nonspecific, we could say, is, feels a little more like anxiety. And we live in an anxious age, which is, which is a kind of low-level fear, um, a kind of um, maybe a general insecurity is one way of putting it. Like, an, uh, maybe a better way of saying it is just not feeling at ease, and you can't exactly pinpoint it. That's anxiety. And those of you that have struggled with anxiety know what I'm talking about. It's like you can't quite pinpoint it. Now, that's true just on the personal level, but I think it can also be true on a larger cultural level. There's dis-ease. And sometimes we can say, there it is. I know what it's about. But most of the time, we just, we just feel uneasy, and it's a, it like hangs in the air. And what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Because if fear and anxiety have their way, um, the possibility that we might grow into generous, compassionate, mature, the best version of ourselves diminishes in, in that kind of culture. So that's, it. that's what I mean by anxiety, fear and anxiety. And wouldn't you agree there's a lot of anxiety? I was thinking about um, that we've been at a, after 2000, um, after 2001, September 11, the United States, Europe, Britain, developed a kind of um, a terror alert scale. And we've been living under the threat of terrorism in a kind of scale. Sometimes, like, I don't remember the colors anymore because it's not as prominent part of the news for obvious reasons. Um, not that those threats have diminished, it's just you know, the news is fickle. It's going to pick on whatever most hooks our attention. So um, anyway, but, but it's interesting because if you just go statistically, there is very, very, very little chance any of us will be affected by terrorism. And I say that as someone who lived in Jerusalem for three years during the height of the Intifada, when there were acts of terror from Palestinian extremists uh, toward uh, Jewish people, cafes and bus bombings. And it was, it was a scary time to live in Jerusalem. And even there, statistically, very, very, very small chance that I or anyone that I know would be involved. Now, not impossible, but very small chance. And globally, even less so. Yet, it scares the crap out of us because it's not predictable. We cannot control it. People say random acts of terror, but that's not exactly what it is. It's, it ex it, we experience it as random, but they're actually intentional, but unpredictable. And, and that activates anxiety. We think we know what we're afraid of. I'm afraid of a terrorist. Um, but the actual threat is never near me, or, or I don't know if it's near me. So it goes into that low-level anxiety. Now, we have been living with that for a long, long time. And, um, and we tried to counteract it with phrases like war on terrorism. But even that is not very convincing, because it's like 
where and who and how because it's not it's not old-fashioned warfare where the enemy is a certain country located in a particular place uh, with a certain organized army not like that so I'm saying I'm saying something about Western people in general living with low levels of cultural anxiety and now extend that out to all kinds of other things um, fear of someone on the other side of the political aisle low I should say low level anxiety um, dis-ease about some, about those people um, and we can say that about about the coronavirus the coronavirus is not unlike terrorism um, in the sense of we don't we don't know where it where and how it moves I mean we know intellectually but we can't see it so it puts us or pushes us into that state of anxiety and um, and you could even say something else so if there's fear there's anxiety and there's angst what is angst? Angst is kind of like existential anxiety. It's like, wait a minute. It's the feeling of maybe the whole system sucks. And I can't quite even pinpoint what's off. And, and we feel that kind of cultural angst right now because our major institutions, political parties, pieces of, of what we call democracy, um, uh, pressures, uh, ideological pressures like socialism, um, they, they're putting pressure on our worldview and our, no matter what your worldview is, and our, our institutions like um, churches and education systems and businesses and, you know, just start going down the list, they're under pressure. And they're, and they're fracturing, at least in part. And that creates that kind of angst. So fear, anxiety, angst, they're related. They're holding hands. They're, maybe they're all rooted in fear. Um, but the way, they, the way that fear is manifested looks a little different um, as it becomes more hidden. So what do we do? And, and here I am trying to give a talk about courage because I'm saying you were made for a time like this. You were made for this age. And I'm saying that like, symbolically and archetypally, you know, the old Greek idea that the soul chooses the time in which it's to be born. I think you find the same thing in um, certain versions of Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and I think in certain versions of Hinduism, but you, you might, could, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but let's just take the Greek idea that the soul chooses the time in which it is to be born. I love that idea, and, and I know the materialist among us and the, the scientists would say, well, that's kind of like, it's human fantasy. But I don't care what you call it. It's a powerful idea that this age, with these complexities and with these fears, anxieties, and sense of angst, what do we do? And part of what I'm saying is I'd like to, if I can just speak personally, be a courageous person in the face of this stuff. How? Is it like suiting up and like tackling it? Is that it? Or is courage like um, ignoring that stuff? You've probably heard me joke before because when I, when I, in the 90s, when I was a kid, I, I was um, super into snow skiing and I still am. I love it. It's like my favorite thing. And, um, and there was this company, No Fear, and I had like t-shirts and hats and, um, and just before we go and do some ridiculous trick, uh, we'd be like, no fear. And then like, go and do it. But the truth was intense fear that I'm going to plow over. <laughs> That's what it was. And, and that, that, that sort of adrenaline junkie sense of being on the edge of death, you know, is that, what, is that what we mean by courage? We should like, like no fear, just like go for it. And I don't think so. Because on one level, denying that it's there in some ways makes it worse and, and also creates more anxiety and more angst. Here's the poem. This is by M. Truman Cooper. 
Suppose that what you fear could be trapped and held in Paris. Suppose what you fear could be trapped and held in Paris. Then you would have, excuse me, then you would have the courage to go everywhere in the world. Suppose that what you fear could be trapped and held in Paris, then you would have the courage to go everywhere in the world. All the directions of the compass open to you, except the degrees east or west of true north that led to Paris. Still, you wouldn't dare put toes smack dab on the city limit line. You're not really willing to stand on a mountainside miles away and watch the Paris lights come up at night. Just to be on the safe side, you decide to stay completely out of France. But then danger seems too close, even to those boundaries, and you feel the timid part of you covering the whole globe again. You need the kind of friend who learns your secret and says, see Paris first. What a poem. I'm going to read it one more time at the end. What a poem. And I think you get it right away. What if we could trap what we fear and lock it up in Paris? All we'd have to do is avoid Paris. And pretty soon we'd find ourselves avoiding the, the, the boundary line of Paris, the city limit. And pretty soon we'd find ourselves avoiding a mountaintop that overlooked Paris. And pretty soon further and further and further away we would go. And there's, there's good reason for this. See, the ego, like what I mean by ego, I just mean my, our conscious selves. I'm not anti-ego. Everyone needs one. Our conscious self is pretty clever. And it says, that's dangerous over there. Don't go near it and you need some limits. And sometimes those limits help, especially if the thing that we're afraid of might kill us. Then we want those limits. You know, you've probably heard, uh, one of the things I learned from, from my um, time in Israel when I was uh, studying Judaism and early Christianity was that um, the rabbis have this great saying, and here it is. They say, put a fence around the Torah. Put a fence around the Torah. Meaning, there's the Torah, which is a series of rules and instructions and laws, and it's more than that, by the way. Torah actually means teaching. But I don't want to go anywhere near violating those rules, so I'm going to put a fence to keep me from going near the rules themselves. Very clever, and it works. And you could say it serves us pretty well at times, until it doesn't. And... In the process, if I go way back to the Zen teaching, we start in simplicity, we move into complexity, and there's some simplicity on the other side where there's a return to the river is the river and the lake is the lake and the mountain is the mountain. How do we get there? Well, we don't get there by continually avoiding something. What's complex? So what do we do? What do we do? The poet says here, you need a friend who tells you, go see Paris first. Then the rest of the world will open up to you. Go see Paris first. What is the poet saying here? Almost like bad pop psychology advice. He's saying, she's saying, he, she um, is saying, um, Go right to the inner chamber where the fear resides. Go look at it in the face. Not as a, not as a, a um, not with a, a sense that I'm here to conquer it, but I'm here to acknowledge that you exist and I'm gonna deal with the fear. And then the whole world begins to open instead of locking it away somewhere. And I think about, so what's that mean in a culture where there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of angst? The invitation, I think here, is to turn toward these things. That the real courageous act is to find out what I'm really afraid of. Or I could even say, if I'm really even afraid. And to follow that all the way through and see what happens. By the way, depth psychologists, 
those who work with trauma, like those who work with very serious PTSD, have discovered something that is absolutely amazing. And if it's true of those like some of our wounded veterans and, and very serious PTSD, very serious bodily traumas, if it's true of them, it's probably true of us too, which is in the therapeutic process, part of the invitation is to go all the way through the traumatic event, not to lock it away in Paris, not to numb it to death with drugs, not to avoid it in other words, but the path of healing, as terrible as it sounds, is to face the terrible thing. And, and by facing the terrible thing, it doesn't actually overwhelm us. The process might feel overwhelming, but it doesn't actually overwhelm us. It's like if you take the coronavirus right now, and I'll just be honest with you. If I say, if I ask myself, what am I afraid of? Well, I guess um, I'm afraid of getting sick. No, that's not it. Um, I'm afraid of infecting other people. Well, I mean, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't call it a fear. Um, I remember right at the beginning, I was really nervous to go into a grocery store. I mean, maybe all of us were initially. I'm talking about March, you know, the mask on. I want to touch anything. I hear someone coughing. I'd be like, oh, shit, you know, it's prob they probably have it, you know, just this like fear. And what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? And instead of avoiding it, that's what the, the poet here is suggesting. So the poet is suggesting here, what does it look like to go, go all the way to Paris? Well, what's the fear? I guess, I guess it's, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Um, and is that it? Is that? Um, and what if I followed that all the way through? Well, what, what is the worst case scenario? I get it. I die. Someone close to me gets it. They die. Yeah, that's bad. And to look at that as a possibility and to bring consciousness to it. Um, and to say, yep, um, this may happen, which automatically raises what I think are the great existential questions. Then how do I want to live? If the possibility of my own mortality is every day right in front of me, and I'm reminded of it every time I see a mask, how do I want to live? And, and if I were to get coronavirus, even though the chances are very, very small, and because of my age um, and health, I think if I were to get it, it would be the chances of death are very, very, very small. It's still there. It's still there. And, and yet I'm still left with this kind of, all right, then how do I want to live? And is there some unlived life in me? that I would regret not doing? See, that's something the soul is wondering about. <laughs> and it's funny how like, what I would think of is when I say soul right now, I mean living the most meaningful life we can live, that ironically, turning toward death, turning toward our fears, it might not be death, it might be something else, um, awakens these kind of questions. The big questions, the human questions that, that, that we have always wrestled with, that's caused us, in a sense, to paint on cave walls and make manuscripts and create art and sing songs and dance and come up with wedding ceremonies and funeral ceremonies and all the stuff that's meaningful in life that... Um, helps us celebrate the dance that is existence itself. So what am I saying? I'm saying what I hear in this poem is a direct, direct invitation to go to Paris. And how are you going to do that? I mean, I mean that in, in, in a very straightforward sense. What if this week, as Christmas, as holidays approach you, what am I afraid of? And to list it out and to try to get clear about it. And to, to look at it, um, to go to Paris first, 
And there's, there, there's something that I, I trust in this poem, to go to Paris first and to face the thing that we fear, to find out, to follow it like a, like a hound with its nose to the, to the ground. To follow it opens up the world, not closes the world. That's the secret here. The world opens up, not closes. Who would have ever thought? And that's what I mean by courage. Do you know how much courage it takes when somebody looks inside? I am amazed. I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I work with people in wild places. Um, I work with pe people in guiding situations. It is unbelievable to me how much courage people actually have in here and are willing to face the hard stuff, to look fear in the eyes and to track it and to say, there it is. I see what this is now. To turn toward the thing they don't want to turn toward. See, that's, that's I think, real courage. And from that, from that place, if we were to trust the poet here, the world opens up. So let me read the poem one more time, and then I'll say goodbye. Suppose that what you fear could be trapped and held in Paris. Then you would have the courage to go everywhere in the world. All the directions of the compass open up to you, except the degrees east or west of true north that leads to Paris. Still, you wouldn't dare put your toes smack dab on that city limit line. You're not really willing to stand on a mountainside miles away and watch the Paris lights come up at night. Just to be on the safe side, you decide to stay completely out of France. But then danger seems too close, even to those boundaries, and you feel the timid part of you covering the whole globe again. You need the kind of friend who learns your secret and says, see Paris first. Have a good week.